Congressman Jeff Heinen joining us here from the Chagrin Falls Heinen location. Uh, people are going to have some questions for you. Again, I can't reiterate this enough. I'm not being rude. I'm trying to look down and get questions some of the times. But uh, you guys are a very interesting set of brothers that have a, a long storied past in Cleveland. So I'm going to start with my own question. Butcher Shop and Shaker. 90 years later. I mean, how special is that? I mean, it really, because it started in your family, it stayed in your family, here you are 90 years later, and you guys just keep going. Well, only about 10% of family-owned companies make it to the third generation, <coughs> right. and only three or four to the fourth. And so, uh, yeah, what we've accomplished as a company is um, uh, certainly somewhat unique and, and not common. Uh, but it's same because we have the same principles today that we had, that my grandfather had that it's about people delivering great service and great quality. So uh, my question is, so your Grandpa Joe started this, trickles down to the brothers, and then trickles down. There were 13 grandchildren. You were the only two that said, I'm in. Give me the grocery business. What are the other 11 doing now? Uh, various careers. Um, they all decided that the food business wasn't for them, obviously, but they're scattered around the country, and only have a few cousins that are left in couple cousins left in Cleveland. So, yeah. Um, so you guys made it to the third generation, as you said, only about 10% of family businesses. Is it going to go a fourth? I mean, uh, yeah, Jeff, what? Jeff has his I, son in the business. So. My son is 26 years old. And he's been in the business about three, four years now. And Tom has a couple of daughters who are, um, they're all in their 20s, basically, and uh, or late 20s as well. And um, they're thinking about coming in as well. A little pressure? Did you guys put a little pressure on them? No, we followed our dad's routine, which was, you know, never pressured us. And if they want, it's a great opportunity, we believe. But no, that it had to be their choice. And so no, no pressure at all. Mm -hmm. I don't, we don't think anyway. So. <laughs> but you have to they love, may have a different story. Yeah, right? you, have to, not here. you have to love the food business and because it's uh, not an easy business. And yeah. It's generally long hours, and, and that's probably why my cousins were smarter than we were. They, they said, I don't really think that's the life I want to leave, because they saw what, what their fathers um, did and our grandfather. I'm going to get to some of these uh, questions that have been coming in online. So this comes from Diane, and she basically says, family businesses usually deteriorate over the years. Not the case with Heinen's, only getting better. What are you doing uh, and looking at to remain a leader and relevant in this competitive market? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Jeff kind of alluded to the way my grandfather started, which was, um, you know, he put a lot of emphasis on his people. And he put a lot of emphasis on sourcing the best food. And um, we, we believe our associates are the key to our success always, and then they always have been for three generations. And, you know, our first strategic guideline, as we call it, is we want associates to love working for Heinen's. And I really believe if you can have... The vast majority of our associates love working for Heinen's. Everything else takes care of itself. So if we can keep doing that, I think our future is pretty secure. And you guys may differ in, in this idea. And in my mind, grocery stores, you know, they, they hit kind of this peak where they kind of remained pretty much the same for a while. Right now, it almost seems like is this drastic change. You have Amazon buying Whole Foods. You have the Walmarts and Targets all of a sudden offering groceries all over the place. I mean, there are, there's a lot of competition out there now with people buying things online or getting delivered. How do you keep up with that? That's a great question. I do think that, you know, Jeff and I have been in the business over 40 years now, and um, I think this is the most transformative time we've ever lived through. Um, and, and you're right, your, your insight was spot on. For the first 15 to 20 years when we were in the business, you know, things kind of crept along and there were some changes. Um, then Walmart showed up in the scene and really changed the value yeah. equation. And, uh, but now, because of everything you just said, the way people get food through delivery, click and collect online, all e-commerce options, um, I think that, but you know, the, the, the basis of what we do is like any retail. You stay relevant, and you provide a differentiated experience. And that's really when you say, how, do you, how are we going to compete? We are. Now, you know, we are in the delivery business through HeinensDelivers.com, and we've started to experiment with click and collect, which is the online come and pick up your groceries. So um, we're going to be in those businesses. But Jeff might have more to add. Oh, you said it well. 
Well, no, it's, it's kind of strange because I wasn't alive in the in the day, but back in the day, like the milkman, right? He delivered it every day, and then right. or every one, however often it was, or bread. It was all delivered, and then we went away from it. We're almost going back to that now. Right. I mean, we talk sometimes the, the the what we call the center of the store, which is where the packaged goods are. Um, will maybe be predominantly delivered one day, but there will always be people who are looking to pick out their own produce or their own um, meat. And, and so it's not, I don't think anybody's predicting that bricks and mortar stores are going away, but people will shop them differently. And we may be going back, as I say, there's no new ideas, they just get reinvented, <laughs> and, and going back to where the stores are smaller. And the store we're sitting outside, Sugar Falls, is a perfect example of that. There's kind of um, some less groceries in there, but the perishables are emphasized. And it's a more convenient shopping option for many people because they don't want the full store. Let's go back online and get some more questions. This comes from Kim. What are grocers like Heinen's doing to keep consumers safe by preventing food il illnesses and recalls? I mean, this is something from the news business. I feel like every week it's like, this has been recalled, this has been recalled. How does that affect you guys, and, and what do you do? What's your plan of action when something like that happens? Well, I, I, I think you start with the idea of being that the United States food supply is the safest food supply in the world. And why you hear about it every week, and, and, and really almost every day there's a recall somewhere, is because the news cycle today is 24-7, and people are much more aware. And when Tom and I look back at the way we handled food back in the 70s when we started and what was considered really good practices, and we always prided ourselves as a company on handling food the right way, but what we do today is light years different than what we did 40 years ago. And so uh, the reality is, is the food supply today is it's constant vigilance. It's training people appropriately. And, and what we do that maybe is a little different is the longevity of our associates is very unique. So we train people, and they stay, and they can use that experience to make sure that the food supply is safe. Let's go back here and see what um, people on Facebook are asking about delivery. Um, and we talked, touched on that uh, briefly about Heinen's delivery. And there was another program were you talking about uh, for delivery? Well, Click and Collect, which is you can drive up and pick up your groceries already shopped. So we call it Click and Collect. And then um, the delivery, what's, uh, and it may be different based on store, but what's the kind of radius for that for some of the Heinen stores? Or is, is it every Heinen yeah, store? Yeah, it's, it it's a very wide geographic area of Northeast Ohio, um, around probably a for a lack of a better number to use, 10 miles outside of any one of our stores. And we partner with a company called Instacart. And you, know, you wonder why delivery is um, appealing to people. Uh, their year subscription for unlimited deliveries is $99. So you think about $2 a week. Um, I think even the milkman you remember <laughs> was probably charging more than that. Uh, Amy wants to know, why don't you allow carts to the parking lots? Uh, geez, that goes back to my grandfather who, um, he had a small, he had, it was when he had two stores. His second store was on South Taylor. And um, he just decided that um, carts, you know, had limited parking lots. And carts would take up parking places. They would damage cars. And he just felt like it was better for everybody if we just, if the customer would just allow us to load their groceries at no extra cost into their stores and police the cars. You know, from a business perspective, us, um, our carts last longer because they're not exposed to all the elements, certainly the wheels. Uh, but really, it's a very unique customer service. And if you move from out of town here, um, a lot of times people don't understand it and they, they're really not used to it and they're afraid to give up their cart. But if you talk to the vast majority of Heinz Loyal customers, they love that service. And it's a tradition we're keeping. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, we're, we're our family-run business. This was something that my grandfather was really proud that he kind of um, innovated in our industry. And we like keeping it. And as Tom said, our customers, as a general statement, really like it. Uh, so people on Facebook are asking about prices. How do you remain competitive with a Walmart and an Aldi? Do you try to, I mean, 
I, that kind of, I guess, brings up a, a bigger point. Do you try to monitor the competition, and is it on a micro level of, oh, they have bacon for this, we need to be there, or is it kind of on a wide scale level? How do you monitor competition and stay competitive? It's uh, <laughs> well. The first kind of to the one point you made is the grocery industry has had a mania about checking prices for as long as we've been in the business, and way longer beyond that. And so we, it is on a micro level. We probably, so you're getting the ad. We probably and not just the ad. We probably know the prices of ten thousand items of of the people we compete against. So we're very aware of that. And you know the value equation is really made up of of price quality and service. And we don't ever claim we're going to be the least expensive option, but for many people, they also value service and quality. And because we live in the Midwest, you know, people are fiscally conservative, so we're very cognizant of where our pricing is, and we work very hard to be competitive, and we're going to continue to do that. You mentioned Midwest. Start here in Cleveland. Uh, you have Oh, and is it 19? Correct. Went to Chicago. Why Chicago? Uh, you know, we, Jeff and I, both agree, like any, like everything we do that's a big decision for Heinen's, but um, we really felt like we could not, um, there's only so many neighborhoods that will accommodate Heinen's and our value proposition. And, and frankly, Cleveland, like every other store, is, is way overstored. I mean, you know, we, we have the same number of people in the 20 in the seven county area as we did 40 years ago when we started and we have millions of more square footage of retail and so it's very challenging and um, so we really felt like we needed to keep doing it because um, we need to give our people an opportunity to grow and because every our business is, our business model is built really on, on our associates and so Chicago at the time we went was a very old established market and they really didn't have a store um, like Heinen's we didn't think and so um, it's 13.2 million people and um, as it turned out we found four neighborhoods that we're very comfortable with and we can continue to look there but it's worked out pretty well for us so far. Yeah and I just want to re I, uh, emphasize the point Tom made it was really first and foremost about our people to give them the opportunity for those who wanted to grow in responsibility, that by growing we could do that. We didn't go to Chicago as we wanted to be bigger necessarily. Um, our focus is on being better, but it was about, it starts with our people and giving them the opportunity, if they wanted, to be able to have more responsibilities. Eyes on any other locations as we sit here? or No, we're, we're, we're for the moment, we're uh, staying put with what we have in Cleveland and what we have in Chicago. I think we really like the idea of having markets where, like we do in Cleveland, we're very um, family oriented and, you know, it's a challenge when you, people like Whole Foods and stuff that build two stores here, two stores there, you know, you talk to those people, if they want to advance, they're picking up and moving their family all the time. So we much prefer to build that brand equity and that brand identity in two markets and really leverage it like we have here in Cleveland. Although our people would like us to open a store in Florida, especially, especially <laughs> today. Especially on a day like today, absolutely. Well, you're nice and warm in the, in yeah, the truck, at exactly. least. Exactly. Uh, let's see. Roxanne wants to know if they're doing anything to offer more local brands in stores. And that, that kind of goes back to, again, Grandpa Joe, the heritage, right? We look at Mitchell's ice cream and some of the things like that. Yeah. I, you know, the reality is, is um, if you start with produce, you know, we're the biggest farmer's market there is in produce is, is in the summer, probably 60% of the produce we sell is local. Um, I, I think we have the, the most local items of any, um, of any company in Cleveland. And so there is a strong focus. We've, over the last 15 years, as we've kind of put increasing energy toward that, um, I think we've learned how to work with local companies so that it's mutually successful. Carolyn wants to know uh, any plans to expand in a, more of a local instead of another city, but kind of another city. She's asking about the Youngstown area. Dana's asking about Columbus. Short answer would be no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at uh, Chicago and, and Cleveland. Yeah. Um, so he here's a, a question. Uh, we, we kind of talked about the carts and the cost and, and kind of and the people. A lot of costs probably go into uh, grocery stores that a lot of people don't realize. I mean, there's a lot of variables to changing. 
One of them just happened in 2019, I mean, when the, uh, the minimum wage comes up. How does that affect you on a scale? You guys have 3,500 employees. How does something like that trickle down and affect you one way or the other? Well, you know, minimum wage, it, it's, there's been a lot printed about minimum wage. So I think more and more people understand the ramifications of it. But, you know, we don't pay anybody minimum wage today, where it's at today. And, uh, but what does happen, the dynamics of raising the minimum wage is, so the McDonald's and the Burger Kings and all those people, they'll pay minimum wage. But that drives everybody else to pay more. And so, and we're, we're never going to want to be at minimum wage. And so it, it has, a, if $15 an hour passed, it would have a very significant impact on us over time for sure. Yeah, you know, the other thing that I think, and this is probably a little bit of a personal rant or whine, but when they talk about minimum wage, they never talk about the cost of benefits. And so, you know, the majority of our adult associates have benefits and the cost per hour is four to five dollars an hour. So you put a fifteen dollar hour wage and um, and then a five dollar benefit cost, it's twenty dollars an hour. It's not that that's um, not necessarily um, the end of the world for somebody like us, but what it does mean, as Tom said, is that everything ratchets it up and so it probably doesn't stop there, uh, number one. Number two is customers today one of the changes in the 40 years are that are people are way more price sensitive. And you know, people want more for less. And so, hey, I want, I, I, I want you to pay $15 minimum wage and I want you to pay $5 benefit, um, but by the way, you charge too much for milk. Um, it's a tough equation and that's the challenge for our industry. But again, because we put the emphasis that we succeed based on our people, um, we take great pride that, that probably of, of any retailer, um, the longevity of our people is very unusual. And our turnover of non-students is like 5%. So um, we understand you have to pay people, yeah. and we do. Um, we talked a little bit about variables. We've got a snowstorm. We've got a polar vortex coming up. Every time that we talk about polar vortexes, blizzards, any of that, milk, bread, eggs, people are all running. How much do you guys look ahead at the forecast and go, we need to make sure we have X, Y, or Z in, in X, Y, or Z stores? Well, we try to look ahead, um, you know, but it is it is amazing that snowstorms, you know, we can't get enough snowstorms. <laughs> <laughs> we, always, we, we, always, we can get enough. We, we, what we really need are the threats of snowstorms. So we love when the media plays it up because, and then it doesn't happen. That's, the, that's our perfect world. But I, you know, grocery stores always make out when there's a snowstorm. Even, you know, you obviously what happens is you get a big push and then the day, day of and the day after is like no business at all. But if you add it all up together, grocery stores make out. And uh, so, no, I think you have to look ahead and you do the best you can. You know, sometimes it's supplier based, you know, trucks get caught. They can't get to you, you know, so deliveries don't get in. And but, uh, you know, for the most part, our people all know that when they see if they know a storm's coming, they do the best they can to order up on all the things you talked about. Uh, somebody wants to know uh, about the downtown location. How's that been going for you guys? I mean, that was kind of a, a different type of project, right? Where you take the Rotundra and you totally redo it into a grocery store. How's that been for you? How's it going? Well, you know, we've been very open about saying that was our investment in Cleveland. Yeah. Um, there weren't nearly enough people who lived in Cleveland when we made the decision. We live in Cleveland today to support that store. But, you know, as lifelong Clevelanders who have watched the, you know, the little bumps in residential growth in downtown, and then they would peter out and, and the vitality of our core area, um, we came to understand that downtown Cleveland needed a grocery store. And, and we knew we would um, lose some money doing it, but for Cleveland it was the right thing. And at the end of the day, if Cleveland's healthy, then Heinen's will probably be healthy. So, so it was an investment in Cleveland. Um, we loved being in a building that you know, was got built, some history, built right? in the yeah, early 1900s and got some great history. And, and you almost can't not smile when you walk in and, and look up. So um, it's been interesting. And uh, we look forward to more of the residential projects getting completed. 
We're going to look down here. Um, we've got time for a few more. What would you tell shoppers who haven't been to one of your stores in years and thinks that a Heinen's is the expensive grocery chain around? Yeah, you know, it's a double-edged sword. When you really have really great service and really great quality, people just assume that you're more expensive. But we work really, really hard to be price competitive. And does that mean that every perishable item we have is exactly the same price as someone else's? No, but you know, not all produce is created equal, not all meat's created equal. And, and so I think, the, I think we're a very fair value. Um, but you know, if you want the cheapest, lowest quality food, Heinen's is a bad alternative. That's not what we are. And you know, the other piece of that is you know, today, more and more people care about how their food is grown and raised. And we may be one of the very few retailers actually in the country who can tell our customers where the bulk of our meat and produce comes from, about who raised it and how they raised it and when it was delivered. And so that's more and more important to people. And so there's a value to that as well. Um, I'm going to end it on this question. This is one of my own. So we don't have to go back 90 years. We go back 10 years. You probably wouldn't have thought that you were sitting in some giant glass box outside of Heinen's <laughs> in, in Chagrin Falls. Let's fast forward. What's, what's the future take? So when we're talking about like online, we're talking about delivering pickup. Is there another giant hurdle for grocery stores that you see in the future? Or a, a giant uh, futuristic thing that's going to happen yeah. that's going to elevate it somewhere else? I think robotics. Are, you're going to see more and more robotics in terms of stocking the shelf, doing backroom stuff. And I think uh, the, the prediction is that all non-customer interfacing tasks could be more moved towards robotics. Almost um, automated, right? Yeah, and um, there's some experiments out there with like robots stocking shelves right now, and not for us, but other people. And uh, so, but you know, at the end of the day, um, people are still gonna want an experience, and whether that's digitally or in brick and mortar, um, I don't think that's gonna change. And um, it's still gonna be about good, good wholesome food and I think it's going to be about relevant products, things that I think more and more people will, um, more and more today, people are managing their own health than ever before. They manage by their exercise, what they buy and what they eat, and how they prepare it. And people, the younger generation has already bought into that. And so I think you're going to see that more and more, that groceries, we, we see ourselves as the pharmacy of the future. You know, that food is, is really good, healthy it's food. It's the medicine, better than a prescription. And, and so I think that will continue to grow. But, you know, hopefully what will happen is that um, Heinen's will still be this great place to shop where people can uh, leave the store feeling better than when they walked in. You got anything to add to that no, in the future? That, that, no, I think Tom hit it pretty well. The, the stores are not going away. They'll yeah. just be different just as they... You know, the stores are different than when we started 40 plus years ago, and, but uh, I think Tom said it perfectly. People will still want that experience, and they'll still want to have that knowledge that we have that we can share with them about where food comes from, how it's prepared, and so uh, there'll be smaller stores. That'd be the only change I would tell you. Tom and Jeff Hunt, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Pleasure sitting Appreciate down with you. Yeah. And we thank you for being a part of Let's Be Clear. A reminder, you can watch this whole thing live on our stream. It'll be up on our Facebook page. And we thank you for being a part of Let's Be Clear. Okay. Thank Guys, you. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, so. Good stuff. Months, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, Anything you didn't expect?